back and talk about Lyme infections. Okay, thank you. Well, as an infectious disease physician, I must say I'm a little bit hesitant to pick up this pointer. <laughs> okay. Um, I've been asked to talk about prevention of uh, healthcare acquired infections. Uh, why are we talking about this? Well, you're talking about it because it sometimes appears as a board question. Um, in addition, the Institute of Medicine uh, has published uh, a document uh, to air as human several years ago, almost a decade ago, that pointed out that about 100,000 patients die every year in hospitals from preventable causes. Um, that's this column, the most common uh, infection acquired in the hospital is a urinary tract, and the most common infection to kill patients in hospitals is nosocomial pneumonia. So you don't have to really remember the numbers, but it's probably the sort of thing that you could be asked uh, which ones are most common. So today we're going to talk about uh, problem bugs, the pathogenesis of HAIs, a little bit about hand hygiene, preventing and treating HAIs, and later today we'll talk about catheter-related bloodstream infections, which is particularly uh, appropriate for critical care, a little bit about isolation precautions, and then what's essential. So there have been four eras in hospital-acquired infections. Uh, the turn of the century, streptococci, group A, group B strep, were major problems, particularly group A strep. Uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, staphylococci became a problem, and there were actually pandemic uh, disease due to staphylococci in hospitals. In the 70s and 80s, with the onset of with the onset of uh, more aggressive chemotherapy, uh, patients began to get gram-negative infections, and uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa became the quintessential bug that you still see in hospitals. And then in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, multidrug-resistant organisms, and with a lot of central line use, vascular catheter use, uh, coagulase-negative staphylococci, MRSA, VRE, vancomycin-resistant enterococci, extended-spectrum beta-lactamases, and in ICUs, particularly Acinetobacter pseudomonas, and a little bit of vancomycin resistance and staph aureus. If you look at the relative rank by site of infection, it differs somewhat. So if you look at um, overall, coagulase negative staph turns out to be the number one pathogen, staph aureus number two, and enterococci number three. So gram positives really are at the top of the list. But if you, uh, if you go down to uh, urinary tract infections, you see they're much less common uh, among uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas tend to be number one and two. And interestingly, among urinary tract infections, E. coli is number one, but Candida is number two, and that's because these data are largely reflect intensive care unit populations. Okay, so the interventions to prevent infections in, uh, in hospitals, and particularly in ICUs, are driven by the dynamics of nosocomial infections. So infections are kind of like an iceberg. For every patient who's infected with a bug, there are probably five to 10 patients who are colonized with the same bug. So if you have one acinetobacter pneumonia in your intensive care unit, you probably have a series of patients who are colonized and potentially at risk. And that's this part of the iceberg. Uh, that central to spread is the hands of healthcare workers. So that's the most important part of uh, infection control. It's pretty basic. Since Semmelweis, hand hygiene is, is the big problem. And then there's a number of other sources of infection that we'll talk about, environmental contamination, antibiotic pressures, transfers from one unit to another. So based on this, the most essential intervention is hand hygiene. So if you're asked questions and hand hygiene is ever one of the choices, it is always the correct answer. Hand hygiene is always the way to answer. And basically, alcohol is good for you. This is just the handprint of uh, someone. This is actually, I think, a screensaver from uh, one of the hospitals on the West Coast where when you get on the computer system, they show this handprint so that people are impressed that their hands carry lots and lots of bugs. The, in intensive care units, really, the problems are device-related infections. And so this is a compendium uh, published about a year and a half ago that looks at uh, vascular catheters, 
uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia, catheter-associated UTI, surgical site infections, and then two particular problematic pathogens, MRSA and, uh, and C. difficile. And so I wanted to go through the different uh, device-related problems because I think they're the ones for which we have the best evidence about prevention and the ones that uh, you need to know about the most and the ones that are queried on, in tests. So this is a ventilator. As you guys probably more familiar with than I was. Ventilators it came into use in about the 60s, and when they came into use, everybody died who went on a ventilator because they all got necrotizing gram-negative pneumonia because the uh, nebulizer was filled up with tap water. Tap water always had some gram negatives in it, and uh, people didn't really think about that as being uh, a source. And it was a major series of publications in the Journal of Clinical Investigation that looked at this area as being the source of these necrotizing gram negative pneumonias, and so people decided you have to use sterile water, and so most of the action then came on this part of the patient in terms of aspiration and it leads to the first question, which of the following measures is likely to reduce a patient's risk of ventilator-associated pneumonia? A one, a closed rather than open suction system. Two, elevation of the head of the bed to uh, 45 degrees. Three, change of ventilator circuit tubing every three days. Four, avoidance of subglottic suctioning. Or five, both one and two. So press the number or letter that corresponds to what you think is the correct answer. Is that Dr. Mazur's choice of music? <laughs> oh, something with the speaker, okay. All right. Um, so 77% of you said five. Uh, the correct answer is two, 20% uh, of you. So I have a little bit of something to teach you, I guess. That's good. Okay. So this is the, you know, bundles are very big now in uh, preventing device-related infections. That's really the buzzword, bundles and checklists. Those are the two major concepts. And so this is the bundle for preventing ventilator-associated pneumonia. Again, hand hygiene number one, uh, aseptic care of the equipment. You avoid contaminating the tubing and so forth. Elevation of the head of the bed to 30 or 45 degrees. Uh, daily sedation vacations and assessment of readiness to extubate. Frequency of tubing change is not an issue, and then there are some other things that are non-infection related. This is from the CDC and from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, who runs the Institute for Healthcare Improvement? Who's the CEO of it? The and what? Berwick. And what does he do now? Yeah, he's head of CMS now. So you can guess that these things that the Institute of Healthcare Improvement have mandated will be now even more mandated by CMS since uh, CMS is paying for all the Medicare patients in the country. And so these things become not only important test questions, but also um, important for uh, payment. So what's the answer? Why was E not correct? So these are the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine randomized trials looking at um, uh, open versus closed suction tubing, and this is the line of equality. If you fall on this line, there's no difference. If you fall on this line, it, flavors, it favors closed suctioning statistically. If you fall on this line, it favors um, uh, open suctioning. You can see that the, the meta-analysis to combine data is exactly on the line of equality. So actually, the, 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 I think they asked the wrong question in these studies. <clears throat> if ventilator-associated pneumonia is largely aspiration of oral pharyngeal flora, what closed suctioning does is changes the types of bugs that are colonizing your oral pharynx. It doesn't reduce the risk of pneumonia. And that's why none of these studies should show, could show a reduced risk. And so they looked at the wrong outcome. The outcome should be the types of bugs, not the incidence of pneumonia. And that's why that was uh, not a correct answer. And then in terms of uh, 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 subglottic suctioning, it actually it does reduce the risk of infection, and none of you really bit for that. Uh, presumably you have pooling of secretions right above the cuff of the endotracheal tube. Those secretions leak across the tube and cause, uh, cause ventilator-associated pneumonia, and by having a suction port right above the cuff in a few randomized trials, they've actually shown less 
rates of ventilator-associated pneumonia, although it's, they're short-term studies, and there's actually uh, concerns about necrosis of the adjacent mucosa of the, uh, of the trachea due to the suction port. And so for longer term, it's not clear that this is worthwhile. Okay, while well, still on ventilator-associated pneumonia, uh, a man, a middle-aged man, has been in the MICU on a ventilator uh, for three days. The admission followed unsuccessful outpatient treatment for exacerbation of underlying COPD. Which of the following findings makes a diagnosis of intercurrent VAP least likely? Absence of fever, absence of purulent respiratory secretions, fewer than 70% PMNs on white count analysis of pulmonary secretions, absence of new pulmonary infiltrates, or both one and two. So select the number that you think corresponds to the best answer. Um, and the correct answer is actually uh, four, absence of new pulmonary infiltrates. So about half of you got that right, and everybody else went over a bunch of other things. This is a paper that was in JAMA uh, a couple years ago from their series of Does This Patient Have X? And this was Does This Patient Have Ventilator-Associated Pneumonia? And there's new, no great gold standard for this, so uh, it's a little bit of a crappy question. But if you look through these, you can see that really the, um, the absence of new pulmonary infiltrates is probably, which makes sense, no infiltrates, no pneumonia. Okay. In terms of treatment of VAP, we'll finish up VAP with this. The, the man from question number two on day six of his MIU stay develops a high fever, pulmonary infiltrates, and a leukocytosis. Which of the following antimicrobial regimens is most appropriate? A ceftriaxone, a carbapenem and vancomycin, another carbapenem, ceftriaxone, and azithromycin or moxifloxacin. All right, good. So this is a feel-good question that you all would get right, presumably. Um, uh, in our hospital, the patient would actually probably get piperacillin, tazobactam, and vancomycin, which is a, uh, seems to be a congenital blood deficiency of, of pip, tazo, and vanco in a lot of our patients, so we try to fix it by replacing it. <laughs> Maybe some of you have that same problem with your patients. Um, and so uh, the question really is, do you treat someone like they have a community-acquired pathogen, or do you treat them like they have a nosocomial pathogen? And so this is the list of... Um, risk factors for multidrug resistant VAP. Now, there is some debate about whether early onset VAP in the first four days should be considered a nosocomial pathogen or not. So you'd probably get a trickier question. It would most likely be someone who's been in a nursing home, comes in on a day two, gets a ventilator-associated pneumonia. You still have to treat that as if it's a nosocomial pathogen. So healthcare-associated pneumonias, that is, in anybody who's been in hospitalized in the preceding 90 days or been in a nursing home, getting home infusion therapy, any of these sorts of healthcare-associated pneumonia factors push you up to a multidrug-resistant bug, and that's probably the way a question would be asked. And in real life, too, someone comes in and you, you don't realize they've been in a nursing home because it's not always clear, and then they come in and they have pseudomonas, not a, not a strep pneumoniae or a haemophilus. And then this is the... Um, the algorithm or the list of, uh, pa of uh, drugs to use. Basically, you're treating for the two most common pathogens, which are Staph aureus, and now, since community-acquired MRSA is so prevalent, that means vancomycin. Um, you would not use daptomycin in this patient. If that were one of the questions, you wouldn't use it because it's bound by surfactant and isn't good for pneumonias. Um, and then you have to cover gram-negative, and it has to be an anti-pseudomonal gram-negative. So you'd have to pick something that has pseudomonal coverage. So you want pseudomonal coverage and MRSA coverage, and you can't use daptomycin for pneumonias. Okay, combination therapy, dual coverage. Uh, there's no data that combination therapy. If a pseudomonas is susceptible to aminoglycosides and to imipenem, giving the two drugs together, there's, there's no study that shows they're better in someone who's not neutropenic than giving just the, the uh, carbapenem alone. And then in how long to treat, um, I don't know that you'd get asked this question. You might. It's, the paper has been out long enough. 
And this is, uh, you might be asked the exception. So they randomized patients in this French multi-ICU study at 8 versus 15 days, and outcomes were similar with two exceptions. There was a trend towards doing worse if you had Pseudomonas or Acinetobacter. So Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter tend to be pneumonias that tend to do worse. Urinary tract infections, the pathogenesis, everybody in the ICU has bladder catheters in. The pathogenesis of infection is either bugs growing up the urethral um, uh, catheter junction, disconnection of this port, or bugs getting into the bag. Um, the one intervention that seems to have been most infect- effective is actually sealing this junction so people don't take it apart. So the sort of questions that are asked about UTIs are closed systems, don't irrigate. Irrigating a, uh, a catheter increases the risk of infection, even if you irrigate with an antiseptic. Keep the bag below the bladder so you don't get reflux. Aseptically em- empty the bag. Putting disinfectants in the bag, which seems to make sense, has never been shown to reduce the risk of infection. So people put bleach in the bags, other things in the bags. doesn't seem to reduce the risk of infection. Um, People who have chronic bladder catheters, the bugs that come out of the catheter when they come in the hospital, so someone comes in with urosepsis, you have to take the catheter out, put a new catheter in, because the bugs that you get out of the catheter may not be the bugs in the bladder, because the catheter gets its own ecosystem because of all the concretions that are in it, and the bugs that are living on those concretions may not be the same bugs that are in the patient's bladder. Um, and asymptomatic bacteria should be treated before procedure. So you're sending someone for some sort of procedure, they have asymptomatic bacteria, you should treat it. It doubles their risk of infection, no matter what the site of infection, what they're doing. So they're going to have open heart surgery, they have <coughs> uh, asymptomatic bacteria, you double their risk that that pathogen will be in their chest wound in five to seven days. Treatment, this comes up occasionally, asymptomatic candida is not treated in catheterized patients unless there's obstruction, invasion, or immunocompromise. Okay, so all device-related infections, I think, that uh, <coughs> compendium I showed you, <coughs> I've already caught your damn cold from just using this thing. I didn't think the incubation period was five minutes. <coughs> He's a friend and colleague of mine, so I'll get even. <laughs> he usually sits behind me at our conferences, so I'll... I'll figure out a way to get even. Okay, so that article, that journal supplement I showed you has uh, VAP, bloodstream infection, surgical site infection, urinary catheter infections, uh, MRSA, and C. difficile. Six different guidelines. Each guideline has about 100 recommendations, 600 recommendations. <clears throat> Only about 20 recommendations get you 90% of the way there. So what are the key things? So these are the key essential interventions. Um, And sometimes these do show up on tests. Again, hand hygiene is always the correct answer if it's one of the choices. For bloodstream infections, CHG prep is about twice as good as iodophore for preventing bloodstream infections. Um, CHG cleansing, cleaning a patient every day with chlorhexidine seems to to have the rate of infections or or less. And, of course, if you don't have a vascular catheter, you won't get an infection. Peripheral IVs. If you look at the site daily and take it out when it's red or tender or painful, you will never have a patient with a peripheral IV infection, and they're supposed to be changed after insertion in some sort of emergency situation or every three days. A Cochrane review came out saying that this is not necessary, that it's a very flawed review, and it's so new it wouldn't be on a test. VAP, we talked about oral chlorhexidine. There are a number of trials that show oral chlorhexidine lowers the risk and actually Oral decontamination in New England Journal of Medicine study from um, the Netherlands lowered mortality. So decontamination of oral pharynx lowers mortality, positioning patients, and sedation vacations. UTIs closed system and catheter removal. About 60% of bladder catheters are not necessary. So catheter removal is probably the best way. Surgical site get a good surgeon. And then there, virtually every device that's been made has been studied with silver on it, and most of the time putting silver on a device does reduce the risk of infection, although maybe not enough to justify the additional expense. But these are the correct answers if you're asked. These are the essential. Okay. So when all else fails and patients get uh, infections, we isolate them. And so questions do get asked about isolation. I'm going to try to focus on some isolation issues. 
This is a picture of a health care provider from the Middle Ages. Um, so isolation is not new. This guy's wearing a gown, gloves, a mask, just like we do nowadays. This is the plague urine, although there was no germ theory at the time. They knew they didn't want to get close to a plague patient, so they used this stick to poke the patient to see if they were alive or dead. We do the exact same things, gown, gloves, and masks. Instead of using a stick, we send an intern in. Okay. So these are the key ways that bugs are spread everywhere in the world as well as in hospitals. And all that we do in the hospital is focused on keyed to these uh, modes of transmission. So the ones that I haven't underlined are the ones that are unlikely in hospitals. So direct person-to-person -person spread is the sort of thing you see in, in nursing homes or psychiatric hospitals where patients have direct uh, contact with each other, often sexually transmitted diseases. Um, common source is uncommon, but is something that always makes journals. So the, one of the big common source problems in intensive care units has been propofol. Propofol is, uh, as you know, you probably know better than I do, is used for uh, conscious sedation and other forms of uh, anesthesia. It is in a lipid-rich uh, base. Um, the original formulations were not refrigerated. I think now they refrigerate it, don't they? Who knows? These guys don't know. They don't do this stuff anymore. You guys, I think it's refrigerated. Um, but when it first came out, uh, because a lot of an an anesthesiologists would draw this stuff up at the beginning of the day and stick it in their pocket, and then use it all day long, it was, uh, there were huge outbreaks all over the country with whatever was on the anesthesiologist's hands. So there were outbreaks of candida, outbreaks of staph, and so forth. So common source problems. We'll talk a little bit about that with IV-related stuff. Vector-borne, um, you already heard about Ly um, West Nile. I guess if you don't have screens on your windows, you can get West Nile in the hospital. So these are unusual. The most common is um, indirect spread on fomites or the environment <clears throat> or from healthcare workers' hands. That is the most common cause of spread from person to person is on the healthcare workers' hands. And then there's uh, airborne spread, which is small droplets that remain airborne, and then there are large droplets. So hands and droplets, either small or large, are the major problems. And we talked about device-related. So this is a picture that's always shown of an um, individual coughing. And there are two types of droplets. They're the large droplets that travel about three to six feet. So they would infect someone in the front row. And that's why no one ever sits in the front row of a lecture, because <laughs> they don't want the, the uh, effluent from the speaker to fall on them. So this, these sort of large droplets spread the common viral respiratory infections in the community. Um, they spread Neisseria meningitidis. So most things that colonize the upper airways are spread by large droplets. As those droplets evaporate, a small percentage of them become droplet nuclei or small droplets. They're of a size less than five microns that will stay aloft in the air due to the currents in the air and travel long distances. So there are three diseases primarily that are spread by the airborne route, <clears throat> which requires generation of these small droplets. Tuberculosis, chicken pox, and measles. Sometimes influenza, sometimes some of the agents of bioterrorism can be opportunistic airborne pathogens, depending on the humidity and the temperature. But in terms of primary mode of spread, only three things spread by the airborne route, TB, chicken pox, and measles. These are the respiratory protection that you wear when you walk into a room. If it's uh, someone who has a disease that's spread by large droplets, meningococcal meningitis, uh, influenza, and so forth, you'd wear a surgical mask. If it's someone who has a disease that's spread by the small droplets where you need a better filter because they're five microns or less, TB, chickenpox, or measles, then you'd wear this respirator. And with pandemic flu, this was a big question about which mask to wear, um, and it led to a lot of questions about the supply chain, whether there'd be enough N95 respirators, and the Institute of Medicine has actually reconvened a panel to discuss that and to review that, and that won't be on your test. But this is the sort of question that will be on your test, potentially. So you're in the ICU, and it's, we'll make it easy, we'll call it seasonal influenza. Patient comes in with seasonal influenza. So the most appropriate way to handle that patient is, uh, one, a private room with negative pressure, Two, a private room with negative pressure and 100% exhaust, that is no recirculation of air. Three, any private room, personnel must mask and gown to enter the room. Four, any private room, personnel must mask for patient contact within three to six feet of the patient. 
and five, any room, no special precautions once antiviral therapy is initiated. So select the answer you think that best responds to the question. Enter it. should bring my guitar next time. Okay. <clears throat> the correct answer is uh, four, 55.5% of you had it. So let's talk about the other ones. Um, a room with negative pressure, um, that is, uh, it doesn't really have much benefit other than a, a surgical room, you know, so surgery well, not even surgery rooms are positive pressure. This really doesn't, you don't really use these very much in hospitals. If you're going to have negative pressure, it's because you want what's in the room not to get out of the room, right? So negative pressure means everything flows from the hall to the patient's room. So that means the patient in that room, you don't want to spread anything out. If you really don't want to spread them out, then you have to either have 100% exhaust or you have to filter the air. And you do that for someone who has an airborne disease, which as I said would be TB, chicken pox or measles. So this would be the isolation for DB, chicken pox or measles. Any private room, person who wants mask and gown, tenor the room, that would be a, a room, a patient where you're worried about contact precautions plus airborne precautions. So this would be a room with someone like Zoster, but even then you'd probably want to put in a room with negative pressure. So that's not the right answer. So remember I said uh, Pathogens that are upper respiratory pathogens spread three to six feet. You want to wear a mask when you go in three to six feet. So this is the only one that really approach, approaches the masking correctly. The room choice depends on the rooms you have available in the hospital. If you have a private room, yes, it's preferable. If you don't have a private room, then you'd put them in a, a two-bed room or a three-bed room, whatever you have, but you'd have the mask within three to six feet. Uh, no special precautions. Well, you know, we don't know how fast antiviral therapy converts the, the patient to negative, culture negative, plus there's resistance, tocilitamivir and the other agents that are available. So this is the only one that really gets the right question for the masking. And th this shows the types of precautions, standard precautions, droplet, which that last patient was on, contact, which is gown and glove, or airborne for the airborne diseases, and shows the different um, protective measures. So hand hygiene for all of them. Private room, any that you can give a private room, yes, but mandatory for airborne and preferred for contact and droplet available. Gloving for contact precautions, so you're going in to see someone who's got a wound that's draining MRSA, you'd wear uh, gloves, the others you wear them as, as necessary, gowning similarly, and then masks within three to six feet of someone who has droplets, and an N95 to walk in the room of someone who has airborne. And then again, eye protection if you think you're going to get sprayed with something that's, a, that's bloody. So this basically summarizes uh, all of the information on the previous question. Okay. This appears always on tests. Which of the following healthcare workers should receive antibiotic post exposure prophylaxis after a patient with a meningococcal meningitis is admitted? A, healthcare workers in the ICU when the patient was there. Uh, second, all healthcare workers who examined the patient in the ICU without respiratory protection. Or the healthcare worker who intubated the patient in the ICU without respiratory protection. Or none of the above require prophylaxis. So. Pick the answer that you think is correct and enter it on your keypad. Okay, the correct answer is three. So why is that the correct?